Hi, my name is Wilson Tang. I'm the research director for the section for heart failure and cardiac transplant medicine at the Heart, Vascular, and Thoracic Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. Today, I'm delighted to have two of my colleagues, Dr. Sanjeev Bhattacharya and Dr. Pavan Bhatt, to talk about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, also called HEF-PEF. This is a very uh, topical uh, discussion uh, as we continue to see many, many patients with this condition. So, uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, what is HEF-PEF? So, uh, that is an actual difficult question <laughs> to answer. Uh, and, and it's because we initially thought this was related to diastolic dysfunction in the heart. And then as we've grown, uh, as we've grown to have more knowledge about this disease, we know that the echo findings we see don't correlate to the symptoms people feel. And we realize that it really comes down to pressure, elevated pressures in the heart. And sometimes that can be missed by just a screening echocardiogram and a screening NT pro BNP or BNP, which is important to really understand. And I think what else is, is, is really important is to know that HEFPEF is a disease without, it, not without consequence, and that the mortality is just as bad as people who have reduced ejection fraction, with the main caveat is we know we have therapies targeted to the HEFREF group, things that we can't give to our HEFPEF patients. So I think it's important to realize this when we see patients, whether it's in cardiology clinic, primary care clinic, endocrinology clinic, and really to sift them to the right providers to help cinch the diagnosis and to see if we can start them on some type of therapy, at least to help relieve their symptoms. So, uh, so Dr. Bart, what are the common causes of uh, HEFPEF that, uh, that is emerging and you know, we are starting to realize uh, that is um, evolving? It's a great question, Dr. Tang. So in terms of the etiology of HEFPEF, um, there's multiple risk factors that have been identified that actually showed increased risk for HEFPEF. So when you look at prior studies that compared HEFPEF to HEFREF, one of the major risk factors has been age. Every 10 years increased age actually increases the risk of HEFPEF by 90%. Similarly, high blood pressure also increases the risk significantly. Every 20 millimeters um, increase in mercury increases the risk by 14%. Similarly, a prior history of um, antihypertensive regimen increases the risk by 48%. Prior history of MI also increases the risk of, by about 40%. All these factors risk on top of each other to actually increase patients' risk of HEFPEF, but as our research has gone on, we understand the disease process more and more. Yeah. So there have been a lot of publications now talking about you know, scores and phenol you know, groups and all that. Are they actually having a new insight into the ideology of HEFPEF? Well, I think all these different score factors are pointing to the fact that HEFPEF is a heterogeneous disease, and we're doing a poor job of characterizing this very heterogeneous disease. All this phenotype mapping and everything else has caused us to actually pick individual phenotypes and tailor therapy specifically to that phenotype, hypothetically the hypertensive phenotype or, or the diabetic uh, phenotype, and allowing us to pick therapies or strategies that actually pick that specific phenotype. Yeah. So with that, uh, I presume with uh, evolving diagnostic tools, there'll be you know, better ways to identify or detect uh, HEFPEF, is that correct? That's, that's the idea, you know, especially with our a model that we're taking a look with a multimodality um, model con com combining cardiac MRI a metabolic uh, evaluation and right heart catheterization. Well, they'll identify these different kind of phenotypes and tailor therapy to that. Yeah, um, so with that, um, there are certainly more and more treatment modalities, particularly tailored to different types of, you know, HEFPEF. Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, what are the treatment strategies that we have right now, Sean? Yeah, I think one is it's, it's always tough because again, there's nothing in the science to show that has been proven to help li patients live longer and really show a, a, an improvement in how people feel symptomatically. We know that from phenotyping hypertensive patients, 
tend to do better with certain blood pressure medications, whether you look at some of the studies where they looked at just essential hypertension like Allhat with chlorthalidone, looking at Prevend and, and Charm, looking at um, uh, ARBs and, and ACE inhibitors, uh, have some benefit in terms of reducing hospitalizations. And I think the biggest study that is out now, which I think a lot of people are looking at even more in depth, was TopCat looking at the use of spironolactone in this patient population. And I think for heterogeneity of where they were actually doing the study, we can always debate about the results. But there is an overall benefit of using these MRAs, whether it's reducing hospitalizations and, and even helping reduce congestion in these patients. But overall, I think all the studies have really taught me is that it's tough to just do an all-comer study in this patient population. We really need to hunker down and really individualize treatment, like Pavan was saying, to really match therapy. So there are some models looking at individualized approach, whether it's the coronary artery disease model and focusing on uh, helping angina and, and microvascular disease, whether it's looking at the right ventricular failure model and, and, and people with significant kidney disease, whether pulmonary vasodilators would work in that system, whether really dialysis is the best route to treat congestion. Um, and really looking at patients with atrial fibrillation as a main driver and seeing if we should treat atrial fibrillation more aggressively versus just doing rate control, anticoagulation, whether we should really move forward and rhythm control these patients. So I think there's still a lot of unknowns and a lot of what we think works, but I think it's going to be exciting in the future on how I think clinical trials may be developed to really look at specific phenotypes versus looking at just the entity of HFPEF in the future. Yeah, and certainly I think it's also a matter of, you know, clinicians kind of coming together to try and actually consistently uh, phenotype our patients, characterize them, and figuring out and having a team approach. So I think uh, our group is just like many other places in the country, is starting to coalesce uh, people interested in this uh, entity or this disease. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about our efforts? Yeah, so I think our, our main initiative in the heart failure section is to create a clinic where we can bring these patients in and one, through you know intake, diagnostic testing, ensure we have the right diagnosis. As we know, amyloid is something that is a pretty typical phenocopy, meaning it's kind of a masquerader in this population. And we have targeted therapies toward those patients, so we want to make sure we're not missing them, or other types of infiltrative or restrictive cardiomyopathies. Um, and then really trying to individualize treatment approaches when we realize these are HFPEF patients. We, we phenotype them through a pretty rigorous sort of uh, multimodality imaging, invasive testing, and, and, and actually exercise testing to see if we can really treat these patients better. But as these patients are, as Puffin was saying, you know, you know, seventh, eighth decade of life, these are older patients with a lot of comorbidities. It, it's not just the cardiologist that's going to really break ground and make a lot of uh, uh, what will really help these patients. It's a team approach, working with primary care doctors, family practices, things like that, that will really help this patient from a more holistic approach to reach their goals um, uh, at the end of the day. Yeah, and there may be many times when, uh, for diagnostic purposes, sometimes people may not even know that they have uh, have PEF, and they may be walking around. I mean, would there be a lot more kind of broader outreach to find patients in the primary care clinic or even those haven't even seen us? No, absolutely, Dr. Tang. I think HFPEF is a very under-recognized disease. And a lot of these comorbidities that people associate with shortness of breath, they just say, hey, you're short of breath because of XYZ comorbidity, when really they have an underlying unifying diagnosis like HFPEF. And the idea behind this clinic is to bring them all in one place, also rule out all these other possible mim HFPEF mimickers, infiltrated cardiomyopathies, amyloid, sarcoid, anything else that could possibly mimic HFPEF that, that, that otherwise needs to be excluded. But like I said, it requires a lot of screening in the primary care population to bring them into our clinic and also sort of characterize them and figure out what the best therapy going forward is. Yeah, and I think much of the drugs, many of them could probably be preventing this, is that correct? Yeah, I think, and we talk about this a lot, and, and 
it's interesting. We're in the in the business of cardiology, and we kind of have, have joked and, and really talked about the movement as going toward prevention, really. And we've talked about that on the basic cardiology level. Obviously, we have our prevention colleagues who are very good. Um, but really, from a heart failure section, it's really cat, like catching these patients at the quote-unquote stage B or people who have sort of structural changes on their heart from an echocardiographic standpoint or have elevated biomarkers, catching them before they become symptomatic where we can really dial in, whether it's blood pressure control, diabetic management with a lot of these new exciting cardiovascular driven diabetic drugs Mm -hmm. um, with other drugs coming in the pipeline, especially with clinical trials in terms of preventing things like quote unquote diabetic cardiomyopathies Mm -hmm. and things like that. And there are also uh, devices that has being used. Is that correct? We we have actually participated in some clinical trials on that. Yeah, and I think that's where the advantage of phenotyping comes in, where we take take a look at specific patient populations who might theoretically benefit from something like an interatrial shunt where we actually put a device that communicates the left atrium and the right atrium and sort of act like a shunt so every time the pressure goes up when somebody exercises and the left atrial pressure goes up instead of causing congestion in the lungs and shortness of breath it goes back into the right side and circulates through so the hope is people can do more feel better and feel like they can actually have a better quality of life. It's a, it's a venting, you decompress, exactly. literally, it's decompressing. <laughs> so this is an exciting time. We really have a lot of things going on. And I think with new technologies and new advances, we probably could help a lot more people. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, together, we probably could uh, see a lot more of these HEFPEF patients, identify them early, and treat them so that we could actually delay their progression.